Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Cold Bold Chats. My name is Kendrick, or Kendo, whichever you prefer. I use the he pronouns, and it's Wednesday again. Yeah, we it's the middle of our week, the middle of our day, and I get to spend it with you. That makes it a little bit better. Uh, I hope everybody uh, has been... Uh, has uh, had a good first part of their week so far that things are uh you know things are fine you've had some good games maybe you've been able to you know get out there go adventuring uh and you know have a good time speaking of adventuring uh today i have the uh, honor and pleasure to talk to one of our three judges uh, from this past adventure pitch, if you were a backer on, uh, I, I believe it was the Game Master's Guide Kickstarter, uh, you might have noticed that uh, at a certain tier, you were able to pitch an adventure. And we had lots of pitches from a lot of different people, and all of them amazing, but there could only be three winners. And we had some amazing judges to be able to decide who those winners would be. Uh, so let me just, I mean, let me uh, be, uh, be the first uh, to uh, introduce you to uh, one of those amazing judges, Sherry Garner Ray. And now you can. <laughs> everyone, Sherry, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone who may not know who sure. you are? Yes, I'm Sherry Grainer Ray. I am. I uh, was one of the judges. Had the honor of being one of the judges for the competition this year, and it was really an awful lot of fun. Um, I started in the game industry in 1989. I started as a writer and a designer on the Ultima series of games at Origin Systems. Since then, I have gone on to work with, um, gosh, everything from Cartoon Network to the Star Wars license to the Disney parks. I worked on two rides in the Disney parks. Um, to stand-up arcades, to live-action uh, kiosks, adventures, Facebook games, little games for mobile, big, big, um, I worked on Star Wars Galaxies, big MMOs, so I've worked on a whole bunch of stuff. And in every one of those places, I've been a designer or a designer manager or VP of design. So design has been my thing for 30-some crazy years of this industry. That is amazing. I'm going to be honest the just the pure amount of experience <laughs> and like just like that's absolutely that is amazing so i mean needless to say you know your way around game design more so than most so i i get i mean being someone who obviously has so much knowledge on like interactivity and like like putting forth like a hook and something like something to be able to like capture an audience's attention and make them want to engage in it what are some of the things that you were looking for in these adventures that like made you go this would this is something that is going to catch a player's attention and make them want to play this interesting hooks i was really looking for a very interesting hook something different something unique not just i met a guy in the corner of the tavern <laughs> i think when we when we play our games we tend to kind of roll with our group uh, and oh, as a side i've been running a dnd group for 30 years same guys every monday night for 30 years a 30 so, year long game you, 30 year you long. found well, a way to lots keep... of different games <laughs> okay, but, uh, okay, yeah. but okay. we do have we do still have the same game we go back to it occasionally but yeah, yeah so I've, I've also been a gm for all this time as well so um so when you've got a regular group running, you can pretty much throw anything in front of them because you can kind of pull ideas out of them and, and you, you run on standing jokes and things that have been saying, being said and stuff like that. But when you're mm -hmm. trying to hook a new group of players with an adventure you're going to put out there for the public, there has to be an interesting hook. It can't just be you met the guy in the corner of the tavern. There has to be something interesting and different. And there, ha there has to be a reason why things are happening. And that's probably the number one thing I looked for was tell me who your bad guy is and why they're doing this. Mm -hmm. um, there's a crazy druid in the forest and he's sending animals at, at the town. Why? Right. I, I, it just can't be no reason at all. There has to be a reason if, to mm -hmm. make it because ultimately as a GM, what we're doing is we're telling a story. We're just using our players to help us build the story. So there has to be good story building techniques. I need to understand who my antagonist is, why they're behaving that way, what their plan is. Mm -hmm. Just because they're evil, 
that's not a one that's not enough that may be enough to run a, a one shot in your you know with your regular gaming buddies that's fine but for a adventure that i'm putting out there for people mm -hmm. to, to look, pick up and look at and go gosh this looks really interesting there needs to be an interesting antagonist that has a real good story about why they're doing what they're doing yeah especially because like a lot of the it, like pre-written adventures right people who are taking them a lot of people are throwing those in their own campaign or even Absolutely. using them to start a campaign so yeah no that that makes that makes a lot of sense uh th and then um i mean we already know which uh if uh you uh worry back on the kickstarter or just in general you can go look at our kickstarter updates and you can see the three that won but i we obviously can't talk about those because you'll see them eventually but sherry i my my question is so of all of, of all of the, the the adventures that you saw that you judged of the ones that didn't win which like what was the like the aspir or i guess the hook i guess since that was the main thing that you were looking for like which was there a hook that stood out in your mind of the ones that didn't win? And like, why Why is that still so cemented in you? I'll, I'll be generic because I don't want to ruin any surprises if anybody's out there. And I said, well, it's the one about the, the pink jack in the box. People go, that was mine. <laughs> so I don't want to do that. So um, I think I really enjoyed, there was a couple that used the environment in new and interesting ways, mm -hmm. not just you know, it wasn't just a generic forest. There was interesting things about the forest or there was interesting things about the environment itself mm -hmm. where the players just don't just, well, I'm just gonna hike over this, you know, across this desert. There was interesting things there that made the desert or the forest or whatever the environment was a real important part of the game itself. Yeah. Um, that takes a spectral type of GM to be able to run uh, it's, it's more than just roll the dice. Oh, look, it's a giant sandworm. Um, <laughs> but really making the environment a, almost a character that they're playing against is real interesting. And there was a couple in there that did that extremely well. And I was I was really pleased to see that. Yeah, that key, yeah, I think the 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 making the location and the environment that you're playing and feel like something that is in, like engaging with you back while you're in it is really, and I imagine a lot of your uh, experience working on uh, like environmental, like interactivity uh, feeds a lot into that. That's super cool. And it kind of ties into what I was saying about the, about the, you know, the antagonist. Mm -hmm. If there's a, if there's a desert, don't, stick a castle out there that how would they build a castle out there right. or if there is a know, castle why you know, is there that, that why is there a castle yeah. why did the person decide to put their castle out here in the middle of the sand desert mm -hmm. when there's no trees or anything to build you know don't give me wooden huts in a place where there's no trees mm -hmm. so so using it in a very wise way was also a big part of that yeah do i guess going along with that are there any and and this doesn't even have to be specific to like of the things that were judged right when you're looking at adventures in general are there any like common like missteps or faux pas that you see adventure writers making that you know you would have advice for like hey here's how to get around this or not fall into the same kind of yeah using cliche monsters oh. um again and again and again we would see the same monster types over and over and it was like that's okay if you can give me a really good reason why uh, and this was not one but say you decided rust monsters you're gonna always use a rust monster well that's fine but tell me why that is there and why that monster is specific and important to this particular adventure mm -hmm. not just because it's a hard monster to fight or because it's you know it's interesting somehow but it has to fit the list kind of goes back to if you can use the desert tell me why you put a castle there if you're going to put a rust monster in that castle why right. is it there yeah. it needs to make sense other than just it's a cool monster to fight yeah it seems like a lot of your your basis for like in the grounding for like how you view game design is a, is a lot around like intentionality right yes if you're doing absolutely. something you should have a reason for why this is doing it rather than just it's here it's cool yeah, yeah. It's, it's, or he's an evil guy no yeah. no sometimes or there's a cool be... castle no castles are cool but no why why, yeah. why would that castle be here if you're gonna have something uh, cool there should be a reason why it's there you know and that just comes down to a lot of taking it it's all takes time and you know you gotta have a lot of time and, and this is 
I, I absolutely really love picking up prepackaged adventures because I pick them apart and use bits and pieces of it in my own campaigns because mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time to design that stuff. Yeah. And, and as I do that as a job, often I don't have time to <laughs> come home and do it in the evening again. Yeah. Uh, so having the ability to pick up pieces that are well constructed and well thought out and fit them into my own campaigns is really valuable, but it takes time to do that. So that also show me that you've put the time in to really consider this as an adventure you want to put out there for people. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I also uh, want to remind our, our, our listeners and our, and our watchers right now, if you all have any questions about this kind of game design, about adventures, please feel free to put them in the chats. And, you know, if if it seems right, uh, I'll bring it up. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, no, that's 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 really interesting. Um, I, w I, I wonder then, like... Of adventures, like I, I guess, as a GM who's been has who's been playing with the group for the last like thirty years, what are yeah. are there any tools or resources that you tend to use that'll help you like try to get you out of the same kind of mindset? You know, you, I imagine playing playing a game for thirty years or playing with the same group of people for thirty years. I, I'm sure over that period of time there have been similarities that you find yeah. cropping up of like not just your own tendencies but tendencies of players as well and like how do you find like what are your ways to get out of the like okay i need to shake things up a bit for both myself and my players is there anything that you use for that or do you just lean sure. into it it's a lot like i do just for basic game design if i'm working on a, on a computer game i it's all about synthesis thinking and synthesis processes. You get your ideas from all sorts of places. Uh, podcasts, television, walking down the street. It, it's constantly thinking about it and thinking, hmm, that's interesting. What would happen if something like that happened in this game? Right. What happened? It's it's reading reading rule books, getting all the rule books you can from other systems and reading through them and see if you find anything that sparks an idea about, gosh, what would happen if we did this? What would happen if we did that? And then sometimes it's just turning loose of the control of your game and letting your players mm -hmm. take control. And then all sorts of strange stuff can happen. And if you're a GM, you can go, okay, let's see where this leads us. Yeah. You know, I don't know where we're going, but hey. Yeah. That... And one particular game I ran, they ended up on riding the top of a freight train down to San Antonio and <laughs> traveling, back, traveling back as they got closer to San Antonio, they, uh, uh, traveled through time till they wound up at the Battle of the Alamo. <laughs> it wasn't intended. It was, that's but that's the way the game happens, went. Right? I, I, that, I, I think that's... I think that's a thing that I personally like looking for in a good adventure is like, where's the spaces for that kind of collaborative nature? With... But it takes a GM who's willing to take that, take that chance yeah. and go, okay, I'm turning loose here. Let's see what happens. Yeah, exactly. I, going to a point that you just mentioned about like taking rule like looking at other rule books uh, for like Absolutely. different systems and taking that were there any adventures that you saw that added that kind of like uh, and I don't know if it's as explicit as this you know when people are writing sometimes but it's like taking like adding like um I guess like ways to interact with people in the environment that seem to be taken from other games. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's a, that's problematic in a published adventure. Yeah, I guess, you know, that's what... I had a couple of those where I'm like, mm, that's mm -hmm. a pretty close take on this from this other particular game. That, in fact, that's real close. So yeah. Would probably you... don't want to go that way. Yeah. Would you have any advice then for any people who are doing that? It was like, if you do want to take inspiration, like how do you make it more fit for a published adventure in a diff for a different company or something like you that? You have to push the push it. You have to push it beyond what it was. Mm -hmm. Take it beyond where you saw it. Say, okay, well that's nice. Well, what's the next step of this? Yeah. And I know we're talking in real generalities here, but um, I can't I, I, I can't really say exactly which one I saw that or which ones I saw that did that. But it's like, mm -hmm. so if you take an orc, okay, let's say we have an orc. What what can we do with an orc that's the next step? Mm -hmm. Can we um, can we put them in space? Can we 
you know, can, what would it look like if you took, or I mean, if we took orcs into space, if we took them and put them into Victorian England and gave them a very structured society, yeah, like a Victorian society or like a Japanese, ancient Jap Japan society, if you put orcs in that, what would it look like? Uh -huh. um, that's what you have to do. You have to push it. Yeah. And by the time you get it through that lens, it's no longer the orcs from Tolkien. Yeah. So you have to push them. Yeah. And be I, willing to let your head just kind of go into these strange places. Yeah. I, I mean, as someone who's been doing this kind of like design for 30, 30 years now, like I'm interested in how, how has this kind of adventure design or interactive design changed over time as far as like what you prioritize as someone who is designing an adventure or like something for people to interact with are has are there any is there anything that stayed the same or and is there anything that's changed over that period of time um gosh a lot has changed tons and tons has changed yeah. um what we were doing 30 years ago would be very cliche today but back then it was brand new exciting stuff yeah um, today it would be cliche because everybody's doing it now. So yeah, it's changed a bunch. And again, this is this pushing it beyond what we already know, Right. pushing it into new areas, pushing it into new patterns. Patterns is probably a good way to look at it. The new patterns of things that we're doing. So like I said, if we, when Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings, orcs and elves and dwarves like that were brand new and exciting and, 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 but even they were a take on the Nordic sagas. And so he took the Nordic sagas and said, what would happen if I set this in, you know, this, in our culture, ancient yeah. history, what would it look like? And that's what he, and everybody went, this is the most exciting, wonderful new thing. But if I say orcs and elves and dwarves now, it's like, oh, the last thing I want to do is run another campaign in that world. So we have to push it. And so, yes, it continually changes and it continually involves. I think the secret is learning Understanding some of the basic underlying motivations and rules, understanding pacing mm. and how to keep your players engaged, mm -hmm. understanding the, the stimulus and response and how people will respond to certain activities that happen in the game and to keep moving them forward yeah. in the game that you're running. That's what's important. And then you can kind of layer your window dressing on over the top of that. But understanding the basics and the basic underlying rules of design yeah. And if you haven't read, um, like Jesse Shell's book on the lenses of game design, that's a brilliant book for that exact idea is understand the underlying rules. And then you can look at things through these different lenses and it brings about all new perspectives that you're doing in game. And that's how we keep our games fresh and alive and moving forward. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Deck of lenses. It's a deck of lenses. Jesse's deck, deck of lenses. I'm going to Jesse write that Shell, down. Jesse Shell, S-C-H-E-L-L. Thank you for that, because that mm. sounds like a great resource. Yeah, I was lucky. I, I was his VP of game design for six years. And so he's he's really fun to work with. He's a brilliant mind. And uh, that book is should be a staple of everybody's game design yeah. education, whether traditional education or your personal education. That should be on your bookshelf. Yeah, no, and that makes a lot of sense. And that kind of like, even like outside of game design, talking about genre as well, when you're talking about like, oh, like I've seen an orc where do I take the next step of works? Like understanding the history of the, of the genre and like why, like what incentivize people to use things in one way versus other ways. And like, well now, what does it look like when you start using it in this new way? I think is a very good, like at least from my own personal experience as a designer and, and, and GM um, mm -hmm. is like, I think the better you understand what you're trying to do, it, 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 the more you can play with it, the more you can bend it, and the and, and the hopefully newer things that you can start doing with it. I think that's really cool. Um, I guess talking rather than talking about uh, the things that are different, are there is there anything that has stayed the same that has always been like, and always probably should be the like primary focus of a designer. Oh, my, my standard running joke on that is as a game designer, my job is to keep you playing my game. I have, I am, I, that's yeah. my job. I have, keep you playing my game, keep you engaged, keep you involved, understand the rewards processes that will keep you coming back and keep you playing my game and keep it fresh and interesting. So yeah, keep to keep the players in your game, keep yeah. them involved. Yeah. 
and that's just building off of like all of that other stuff is how you yep. how you how you do that yeah absolutely absolutely um as someone has said i love the well thought out building i really connect with the question everything mentality while building things out and i yeah 100 percent agree it 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 it's yeah it just makes things better when you think about things oh know? yeah and it can be hard don't get me wrong i understand if you're running a weekly game and you've had a big long week and you've been at work late three nights and and you know the dog had to go to the vet and you know the kid's sick and, and oh my gosh you've got to run that game on you know tuesday night or saturday afternoon and you don't have to always have time <laughs> to sit down and write the whole backstory on this particular guy sitting in the tavern that you need to give the quest to this is where having adventures you can pick up and slide into your game works so well but so i understand you don't always have the time but that's okay uh, embrace that use what tools that are out there pre-published modules are there's nothing wrong with that and taking the pieces of them and pulling them into your own game i've, I've done that forever because again time I, I don't always have the time to sit down and write out my entire world yeah yeah um I and, and I guess uh, going off of that, when uh, looking at, you know, these adventures, knowing that they're going to be published adventures, right, uh, that GMs might be doing that exact same thing, um, how much Lee, like, G talking about the like the gaps where it's like oh this is where the gm will like either like fill in or like be able to take things out like would you uh, suggest that designers try to fill in as many details as possible so that there's less work and thinking on the gm's part or leaving space for the gm to add their own spin to um to to an aspect. well obviously you want the gm to add their own spin because they want it to make it fit their particular game but i think it's important that what is produced is a complete package mm -hmm. the beginning middle and an end and everything is in there to answer all the questions that might be answered mm -hmm. and then you can let the dm figure out where they want to slide in their own you know personal touches to make it but you want to make sure that all the questions are answered for the gm yeah the who because uh, they may not have time to answer these questions. And that was the other thing I, I saw in some of the ones that came through is they were not a complete package. Mm -hmm. It was it was almost a, a slice. It didn't, it kind of began, but the middle and the ending kind of rambled off. And it's like, no, it needs to be a very tight little package and there's a reason for it to exist. Mm -hmm. And it, it answers all the questions that the GM might have in this world or worse yet, the players are gonna ask about the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have uh, a question from Kai Hawkeye. Uh, other than the obvious, get off your butt and just do it. What is your one best suggestion or tip for someone just getting started in writing homebrew worlds and adventures? Read, 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 read books. I'm not talking about you. read rule books. Yes, we all have our stack of rule books by the bed, right? <laughs> rule books, but also read, reach out and expand what you are reading for yourself for enjoyment. Um, one of the things I did a couple of years ago is I made it my, my project for myself is that I would reach out to read science fiction and fantasy by minority authors mm -hmm. because it is a completely different perspective than the traditional, you know, person that's writing fiction, which is traditionally a white male, middle-aged white male guy. Yeah. Find the minority authors, go read them, go read fiction set in other places besides what you are comfortable with. Reach out. Some of it won't be very comfortable, but that's okay. But when you expand your brain that way, it all feeds back into your own design process. So when you're designing the next module or the next adventure, you have a lot more things to pull in, to blend into your the stories that you're creating. So reach out, read beyond stuff that you usually would read. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, it, that makes a lot of sense. Because I, I think the times that I found myself the most inspired has always been whenever I'm in a new place that I've never been, talking with people with different experiences for me, or like it, in taking anything that is like, oh, yeah, no, I never would have thought of it like that. And like, yeah, that just kind of adds on to the foundation that. Yeah, and the, the new internally. voices and the new, you know, read read science fiction i mean if you've ever have you read three body problem three body problem was written by someone from china it was translated from chinese mm -hmm. very different take on the world very different take and that that feeds our own process and broadens our own ability to think and create mm -hmm. 
yeah no that's absolutely amazing um let's see uh this, hey, uh this is your last chance everyone if you have any questions please please send them in um i'll give you all a second to do that um but yeah, no, it's it's been an absolute joy talking to you, Sherry. This has uh, been you. I I would love to be able to pick your brain more about about Anytime. design and such. Um. Uh. But yeah, no, this has been uh. Ab I don't see anyone typing, and I don't see any questions. So. Uh, oh. Uh, well, I will tell you that I when I am looking to hire designers in the computer game industry, I look for people who have run tabletop games. Oh. It is one of the best foundations in understanding player motivation and pacing and structure of anything I've ever done and anything I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So if you're just starting, run more, keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to have some adventures fall flat. I've had, I've had adventures in the last two years fall on their face because I was trying something new. And my group went, mm, yeah, no, this isn't <laughs> doing it for us. And I was like, well, okay, I won't run that style again. Yeah. Um, Try different systems. I try different stuff. Just try it. And if your group says they don't like it, okay, go on to something else. But you learn from that. You learn. You can say, what didn't you like about it? What mm -hmm. didn't 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 hit the buttons for you? What what was it? And then that again feeds in. So don't be afraid to try and keep going because you learn something every single time you run. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, on Twitch. Uh, how do you slide DM a TTRPG game for two years onto a resume? <laughs> I just put it on there. Uh, if 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 you're looking for something in the gaming industry, it's legitimate experience. Yeah, um, absolutely. Sense. If you're not in the game industry. Uh, you're gonna have a little harder time selling that as real experience because we still have people that do not understand that adults actually play games. So yeah, I wouldn't. But if you're if you're looking for a game industry position, absolutely, just put it on there. And game master to, you know, this for this for you know, game master to a tabletop RPG for five years weekly for five years for six players running six different systems, you know, including my own homebrew, and then provide an example of it provide an example of your homebrew. In fact, that's when I got into the industry. Of course, 30 years ago, there wasn't really an industry. So I, I can't say there was, I, when I got into the industry, when I started making computer games for a living, um, I had no experience because there was no experience to be, have been had other than tabletop RPG. Mm -hmm. And so that was part of what I submitted was some of my own homebrew rules that I'd been running mm -hmm. you know, in the games that I'd been playing. Because of course, I've been playing longer than I've been in the game industry. Right. So yes, if, if it's a game job, put it on there and submit your rules to back it up. Submit something to show that you've actually done it. That's very good advice. <laughs> very good advice. Uh, I've had it come in. I've seen it all in the resumes that come to me. Absolutely. I like to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you heard it here. Maybe not first, but definitely uh, you, you've heard it here. So <laughs> they said I'm a veteran. Somebody, who's, somebody who does hire people in design. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> amazing well thank you so much sherry it has been a sure. joy speaking with you uh uh is there uh any projects uh, other projects you uh have upcoming that you want people to be on a lookout for uh or if anybody's interested in anything that you do where should I, they come and find you uh you can find me at sherry i am uh i am currently working uh for romero games and on a subject, of course, project, of course, I can't talk about because that's the nature of the game industry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they they actually brought me out of retirement. I had retired uh, and they brought me out of retirement to come back to work. Uh, you were just too me. good. You were just too good. Yeah, it's, we're having a ball. It's just a tremendous amount of fun. I'm, I'm thoroughly I'm glad I came out of retirement for them. They're, they're a great group amazing well thank you so much sherry uh, uh everybody we're gonna take a quick five minute break and then we'll be back because i got some cobalt press stuff to talk to you about so i will come uh uh i will see you then uh go get some water use the bathroom get something to eat whatever you need to do we'll be back hello everybody i'm back hope you missed me please i hope so uh that was I thought an amazing conversation, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with Sherry, uh, talking a little bit about game design. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if anyone, if, I, I think if anyone 
is uh, qualified to talk about, hey, here's what makes a good uh, adventure, and then judge uh, uh, to see what adventures get published, I think it's Sherry. She knows a thing or two about it. <laughs> Coordinated weekly meetups for industry specialists and regularly prepared supplementary content for discussion and collaboration, also known as I ran a D&D game for five years. I <laughs> love that. Um, awesome. So uh, I just got some things I need. Let's, let's talk about them. Let's talk about them. What we got today, Jiro? Oh, wait, hold on. This is the one from last week. Give me one second. Sorry, Jiro. You're going to go. You, you got to go. You got to go, bud. You can't be here right now. <laughs> you're, the, you're the one from the past. I need the one from the present, Jiro. Okay, here we go. Hey, Jiro from the present, what we got to talk about this week? Bam. Thank you, Jiro. You're the one that I want. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. <laughs> Hey, oh, this is the, well, you know what? I was going to talk about Castles and Crown pre-order first, but hey, we're going to go ahead and talk about this. You might have remember Black Fra Flag Friday, but now it's TOV Tuesday, where we already talked about what happened last Tuesday, but this Tuesday we're talking about the Mechanist, baby. All of you have been asking for it. All of you have been asking for it. So, hey, here's a little preview. You could go over to the Cobalt Press blog right now and get a preview of The Mechanist to show you what all 20 levels are going to look like. But you only get up to the second level as far as actually getting to read those fundamental... You know what? Let's just read through it right now. Let's just read through it right now. Let's zoom in. Oh, no. That's not very clear. Can you read that? Yeah, I'll read it for you. Mechanists are inventors, makers, and engineers interested in the composition of material objects and in the components of creation itself. While others dedicate their lives to mastering magic or science, the Mechanist sees such forces as flexible components within a grander design. To walk the path of the Mechanist is to open the back of the universe, observe its moving parts, and restructure them as suits your needs. Mechanist is a class that invites creative interpretation by players. Your class can hold up in combat, but finding ways to use the items and objects around you brings out the aspects that makes this class shine. Whew. Uh, jumping in and say hi, curious about TOV a bit, but very interested in Midgard lore talk too. Any plans on that happening in these chats? Absolutely, we talk about Mid uh, hey, every now and then we crack open a Midgard book um, to, to, to see what's going in there. I am someone who's still learning about Midgard, as, since I'm still relatively new uh, at Kobold. So every time I get to open a book that tells me a little bit more about that wild and crazy world, I love so yes absolutely you can you 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 can expect that um but yeah so uh this is the mechanist um that's so cool so cool let's see we got d10 con modifier here 1d10 uh uh duh, duh, duh. so d10 hit die you get light armor medium armor shields you get simple weapons martial weapons you get tanker tools and two additional tools of your choices con and int or your saves i don't know why this is the voice that i've slowly taken on for this um uh let's see starting equipment yeah, yeah, yeah whatever let's get into the juice of it eyes of the maker level one uh mechanist feature when you touch a magic item or i love how the mechanist <laughs> yeah you know what yeah no let's keep doing this yeah you know what zach says zach says he loves it that means i'm gonna keep doing it uh, it's your new mechanist character taking over. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm slowly, I'm making the character in my head as we go on. When you touch a magic item or some other magic imbued object, you learn its properties and how to use it, whether it requires augment to use or, and how many charges it has, if any. You learn whether any spells are affecting the item and what they were or what they are. And if the item was created by a spell, you learn which spell created it. Okay, that's cool. So you immediately get to kind of analyze things and, uh, what's the word? Appraise them. Here we go. Uh, uh, shard of creation. 
You learn how to craft a shard of creation, which is a tiny magical object with many uses that appears on your person. In its base state, the shard appears as a constantly shift and fluid like bundle of plasma. I like that the shard of creation kind of the with the constantly shifting fluid, like it's giving me um the philosopher stone or like the liquid philosopher stones uh from uh um well i guess it whether the philosopher stone is like a liquid or a solid really depends on uh what you're reading because it could be either um but i i like that kind of like it feels like a philosopher stone without them explicitly saying it the shard vanishes instantly if you are slain or if it is not in your possession for more than 24 consecutive hours um, my brain lost where I was. If the shard is destroyed or you lose it, you can perform a one hour ritual to create a replacement. This ritual can be performed as part of a short or long rest. The shard has a number of charges equal to your int modifier with a minimum of one. And you regain all expended charges when you finish a long rest. <laughs> Excuse me. Charges can be spent to activate the following properties. Ooh, okay inspire when you make an ability check while touching the shard regardless of its current form you can spend one charge to roll a one uh, a d6 and add the number roll to your check result oh okay cool so it's like a little it's be it's better than a guidance and it i guess it can it can only be used on yourself um oh wait can you give it to it can other people use it It doesn't, can other people use the shard if you want? Cause it doesn't say, my guess, my immediate guess would be no, other people can't use it. But it doesn't, dis it can not, it, it has the ability to not be in your possession. Huh. I guess it says you, not a creature, so. I'm going to assume that it means the player. That's reading comprehension, baby. Uh, transform. <laughs> While touching the shard, you can use an action to transform it into any type of non-magical weapon or shield. Or into any object of medium size or smaller. The object appears in an unoccupied space within 10 feet of you. But the chosen space must contain a surface or liquid capable of supporting the object. If the object you create is of an appropriate size or to be worn or held, you can choose the object to appear in your hand or on your person. The total value in gold pieces of an object created can be no more than 20 times your mechanist level. Okay, that's sick. So immediate, so medium size or smaller medium size, I guess would be in a five by five cube, like cubic space. That's pretty big. Can I make a five by five cube? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> What would, if the object, yeah, wait, how much would it weigh? Ugh. Now I'm trying to think of problem solving. Like, how would I get, no, but this is like this immediately, like it makes me start thinking, how can I use this to solve problems? And I think the fact that I almost immediately start going, okay, so what can I do with it? Like, ooh, that's so, that's so fun. That's juicy. I love that. A transform shard remains in its new form until you die. Use an action to return uh, it to its original state. Got a weighted pressure plate? No, it, like literally, that's, I was literally thinking about, could I use it for a weighted pressure plate? Like how much would it weigh in that moment? Um, ah, this is cool. This is, see, I, and I, and I love that it immediately, it immediately sells me on the thing that it, like, on the thing that it says that it's supposed to do right it this is the class as invites creative interpretation it wants you to find ways to use the objects on your disposal to solve problems and like and imme like i immediately started doing it just reading it like oh shit, uh, what can, what can i use this for it's this is good um a transformer shard uh, remains in its new form until you die use an action to return to uh return it to its to its original state or use an action to transform it again. No matter what shape the shard assumes, those who handle the shard can sense something strange about its nature. The shard can't be passed off as a typical item for the purposes of buying and selling. 
Yeah, no, that, that that makes sense. You can't just you can't just sell it to someone like, oh, look at this super cool magical object that's gonna disappear in twenty four hours. That was <laughs> that was a good that was a good catch. You all <laughs> you all caught that before it became a problem for a GM. Can we uh, get a sneak at a subclass? Uh, I'm sorry, I can only show you. I can only show you what's on here. So, uh, uh, tragically, I cannot. But this does lead into a thing that I will be talking about soon. Uh, after we look through this. I'm so sorry. Um, you gain the ability... Uh, augment. You gain the ability to channel magical energy into items. To use this ability, you must spend one hour focusing on the item that you wish to augment while remaining in physical contact with it, which can be done as part of a short or long rest. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, 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 you can find all of this uh, on the Cobalt Press blog. The Mechanist is a martial class, which is interesting. It's not a... Oh, yeah, whoa, I didn't even recognize this. There are no spell slots here. Fascinating. Ooh, that's really interesting. This is immediately like so different from the Artificer in a way that's really cool. Cause I think the Mechanist really makes me sit down and like, it makes, it makes me, th it makes me think about how things work. And it makes me think about how to solve problems. Like, in a way that I think is really, really cool and like makes me feel, makes you feel inventive, makes you feel like when you sit down and you're like trying to solve a problem and you're like, oh, okay, cool. Also this thing that can turn from a weapon into a tool, right? So you can fully go on like, oh, bam, 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 we're sword fighting and oh no, now we need to get this door open. Hey, I'm gonna make a little. I'm gonna make a crowbar or something out of the sword that I was just using, or make a um. What is it that people use to lift cars? Like one of those. You can make one of those. You can lift a, a stone door, and it's like it. It just makes you feel cool and smart. A jack. Thank you. Um, my name. My I just couldn't. A piston. Piston also works. Uh. We gain two augment. Okay, so sorry. I just, I think this is super cool. Uh, augment. You gain the ability to channel magical energy into items. To use this ability, you okay? Yeah, I talked about that. Uh, you gain two augments uh, effects of your choice. Augment effects options are detailed at the end of the class description. At certain mechanist levels, you gain additional augment uh, effects of your choice, shown in the augment uh, effects known column. Oh, okay, cool. So you know two three four and you can have oh so you can have two effects but augment up to three items so it's much more about the core of this class is much more about tinkering with things that already exist um or changing your cool philosopher stone thing um it's so cool when you use this ability uh did you choose effect yeah, yeah unless specified otherwise a chosen effect lasts uh, indefinitely, but as an action, you can touch an item to end an ongoing effect. Okay, cool. Are there any? Come on, can you show me any effects? I want to see the effects. No. 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 I wanted. I wanted it. I wanted it, but I couldn't have it. It. Tragic. Well, I guess we're gonna have to wait. But I don't think we're gonna have to wait long. Because going, so that was TOV Tuesday. Uh, every Tuesday, you can find some more information about Tales of the Valiant over on the Kobold Press blog. So go check that out. Uh, heck, I'll go ahead and put the link right here in the chat so you can go check it out yourself. Because there's more information on that blog page uh, than, well, just what I showed you. Um, there's more stuff, so you can go read that now. Uh, up next... You know what you love it? Campaign Builder Castles and Crowns is now on pre-order on the Cobalt Press store. You can go, hey, oh, this is really big because I zoomed in for the other page. Boom, here we are again. Look at that. You can go pre-order Castles and Crowns and I believe also the map folio over on the Cobalt Press store. Um, you could just go do that. Uh, that's available to you now. Do with that information what you will.
<laughs> um, as I've said before, and I will uh, say again, if you are interested in being a, a GM for Cobalt Con or being uh, being an assistant, um, oops, wait, hold on, let me fix this before. Bam. Or interested in being an assistant for Gen Con, please, please, please go sign up, and I'll put these links in here just for you, so you can, you know. Go do the thing. Uh, you can find information about what being a GM or what being an assistant uh, entails in those links that I've just sent you. Um, so you can go ahead and do that. The last thing that I have to talk to you about today is that the full Black Flag reference document is going to be live coming in May. I can't give you a specific day yet, but trust me, it's coming soon. And so what is the black flag reference document? What is that? Well, it is going to be our, it is our version of the Tales of the, well, I mean, it is the Tales of the Valiant SRD. Now, what does that mean? It means that every, so when you get the, when you, when you look through the black flag reference document, it, May, uh, my birthday is May 17th, just saying, okay, you know, we'll keep that in mind. We'll keep, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. <laughs> um, but, so, the Black Flag Reference Document is going to be a public document that you can use to start writing your own adventures and supplementary material with stuff from Tales of the Valiant. It is a free public document. You can use it. It's going to like you can you can just you you can use it to make whatever anything that is inside of that is free for you to use in your own material. Um, uh, and so what? Sorry. Whew. The full BFRD when you get it is going to have all of our classes. Which means that it has one extra class from the original 5e SRD because the uh, the artificer isn't in the SRD, but the mechanist will be in the Black Flag reference doc. So you can use the mechanist and all of your stuff as well. It is going to have all of the information for every class. It is going to have over 400 monsters with descriptions that you can use in all of your designs. You don't need our permission. You just take the black flag reference document and you do it. You use it. That's yeah, no, it's yeah, it's it's just that simple. It's just that easy and it will be coming uh it's coming early May. Um just in time for Cobalt Con on uh, May 10th uh through the uh 12th. I don't I forgot how days work for a quick second. So be on the lookout, check our socials, check our blog, be on the lookout. Cause once that black flag reference document hits, that means it's gonna, it's, hey, it's free game. It's free game for you to do. And we will also be having, uh, I think May 1st, we'll have uh, the uh, black flag adventure pack number two coming out, which has uh, more adventures uh, for you to see. Like this is like, this is the kind of stuff you can be doing with the black flag reference document. Um, it's coming May 1st. Uh, Cobalt Press has an adventure in it. Uh, it's going to be... It's going to be good. Magnol, signed up to be a GM. I hope you're okay with... Yes. Hey. Yeah, well, well, yeah. It's okay if you're a newer GM. It's fine. You know? It's... The important thing is that you're good at what you do. And you're having fun doing it. Can't wait to be able to make my homebrew world TOV compatible. Literally. Like, literally anything you... You want to start making adventures using the information that Sherry gave us earlier? Because that was great. Um, using the Black Flag reference document. You want to start making your homebrew stuff? TOV compatible? Boom. Boom. You better get ready to build. I hope you're ready to build, because I'm ready to build. I finally... I think I told you all, I finally played uh, TOV when uh, we were in Seattle a couple of weeks filming that thing for Cobalt Chats. Or not Cobalt Chats. Cobalt Con, um, and I'm more excited than ever. I'm so I'm 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 way more excited than ever to play this game because I had so much fun playing it, and it was everything that I hoped it was going to be and more. Dyson, thank you for the raid. Thank you for the raid. 
that was I, I had just said the last thing I had just said the last thing that I was gonna say and I'm so sorry and that's not your fault that's not your fault how are you supposed to know how are you supposed to know that's okay hey come here sometimes a wizard is never early or late they arrive exactly when you mean to and I know that you ex arrived exactly when you meant to it tragically was too late for me now <laughs> But hey, guess what? Uh, this VOD is going to be up immediately after this. So if you are actually interested in hearing about the stuff uh, that <laughs> that, uh, that uh, we talked about today, uh, you can go check it out immediately. We had a wonderful conversation uh, with uh, game designer Sherry Ray, who was one of our judges uh, for the Adventure Pitch um a competition uh talking to us about game design what she looks for uh in a game and guess what hey uh she's been doing this for over uh, for 30 years so i think she knows exactly she she knows what she's talking about uh so uh if you want to go check out that conversation you you can you know uh once this bot is up and if you're watching this friday you already watched this uh so good on you if you got to this point, you already watched it. So whatever. Uh, <laughs> that's all I have for you this week. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, a wonderful rest of your week. And I will see you all next week. Because guess what? I have another interview next week with uh, designer Jeff Lee to talk about their work on Campaign Builder Dungeons and Ruins. Because if you didn't already know, the Kickstarter is just around the corner. So you, it's gonna, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be good if you aren't already, uh, if you haven't already gone to Kickstarter to click to get notified on the launch of Dungeons and Ruins. Hey, go do that right now. Um, I'm gonna throw the link in the chat here for you. I, that's the wrong one. What did, oh, huh? What did I make it? I don't remember. Oh no. Oh no. That's on me. You know what? I'm just going to go find my link. I'm going to go find my link right now. That's literally nothing. I have that power. I, I have the power. Tragically, I'm not He-Man. But hey, I did get this link for you. And that's what is important. If you go and click on that link, you will get notified uh, on Kickstarter launch. And when you get notified on Kickstarter launch, you will also get a free PDF copy of Trap Master. Uh, so you get a free book out of it. There's no reason not to click the button. There's no reason not to, do you, do you hate free books? You hate free books? That's so weird. That's cringe. Hate free books. <laughs> Couldn't be me. Uh, <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, I will talk to you next week uh, with uh, Jeff Lee. And uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's all I got for you. So my name has been Kendrick or Kendo, whichever you prefer. Uh, you find me everywhere on the internet at Kendo Makes Films. You can find my actual play podcast, Tales Yet Told, at Tales Yet Told on anywhere in the internet that matters and wherever you get your podcast. Uh, hey, thanks, Royal Rugby. Thanks for being here. And I will see you all next week. Don't forget to go out, eat enough food, drink enough water, get enough sleep, and take care of yourself. Dang it. Because self-care is very important. And don't forget to love yourself and everyone around you. Peace. Peace. I don't know why I'd put up four. That means nothing. Peace. <laughs>